Normally, when we start the show, we start off with some nonsense conversation, maybe an anecdote, maybe some bullshit, maybe some, you know, nonsense about my day, Mike's day, whoever's day. But if you're watching this right now live or you're watching this later on YouTube, you'd already see something different tonight. We've got a special cast. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, so tonight is our special little Soul Hackers 2 spoiler cast, kind of Atlas chat, JRPG chat. So if you haven't played Soul Hackers 2, this is your chance to pause this episode, come back at a later date. If you don't care and you just want to hear his bullshit, then stick around. We're ready to go. So without further ado, welcome everyone to the Past Control Podcast, a show where a couple of best friends talk about the latest in video games and nerd culture. Sometimes we have guests and tonight is one of those nights where we're going to talk about Soul Hackers 2. And as always, I'm your host, Brendan Groom, and joining me on this lovely evening is a special cast of both returning and first time guests. Joining me for the first time on the show, you may have read their words at Prima Games and may know them as one of the only people to platinum Babylon's Fall on PS5. <laughs> that is the one and only Lucas White. Lucas, how are you tonight? You know, there's uh, there's something there's something eerie about the timing of recording a podcast on Soul Hackers 2 when a, a true 7.5 game in Gotham Knights is upon us. <laughs> we are definitely in a week of some questionable uh reviewed games, I would say. Um I, I would I would probably say Babylon's Fall is more of a three, but that's just me. Um <laughs> also joining us when they're not busy and walking, you can catch the work over a fan bite. It's the one and only Michael Hyam. Michael, how are you doing hey. tonight? Doing all right. Uh, it feels good to be chopping up with y'all, uh, Brendan. Uh, I love I love chopping it up with you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think I've made my thoughts and feelings pretty well known about Soul Hackers too. But like I said before the show, uh, I think there's still like value in dissecting uh, what the game is, what happened in the game, and uh, you know how we all feel about it, uh, especially in like contrast to other JRPGs and other Atlas games, especially as we are on the dawn of Persona 5 Royal being available mm -hmm. to everybody <laughs> in the world, regardless of what platform you play on. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, always an exciting time to, to, to be with y'all. It is, it is a beautiful day. I love having you back. It's it's great. Apparently, you're just the Atlas guy because you were here for Persona 5 Royal. Now you're here for this. So yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what's next. Maybe Persona 3 and 4. Who knows? Who's to yep. say? And rounding us out this evening, taking a break from interviewing Reggie fils you can find his work all over the place, most recently at IGN and hosting his show, Unlocking Kingdom Hearts, the one true guest, King, <laughs> Kingdom Hearts. I almost called you Kingdom Hawkins, <laughs> Cameron Hawkins. Uh, Cam, how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing all right. You know, I'm, I'm ready to talk about this game that we've uh, all finished like for probably six weeks that we're finally sitting down to talk mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. Listen, life, life it, you know, it gets busy. Things come up. You know, uh, raids happen. Uh, other uh -huh. games get in the way. Overwatch two payloads are there. I mean, there's there's a lot getting in the way, but we found the time to meet. A couple of quick housekeeping things though before we get into tonight's show. This episode, of course, is sponsored by our for good friends at Goodnight Fatty. If you're unaware of what Goodnight Fatty is, you can check them out on social media at Goodnight Fatty and at Good Morning Chubby. And let me tell you, you will not be disappointed. You will be a little sal you'll be salivating, that's for sure. Uh, but Check them out. Give them a follow. See what they're all about. And if you are in the North Shore of Massachusetts, make sure to head on down and let them know past the controller sent you down there. Uh, the PTC Movie Club for October is a double feature. So if you want to hear us talk about Shrek the Musical and <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors 1986, uh, make sure you watch 1986, not the, the other the play of the movie. Uh, or I guess the, it's a play first and then a movie. I don't know. I'm not a doctor or a movie person. So uh, remember when Cam used to go by the cinephile guy? I remember that. Yep. Yeah. That's yep. OG Cam right there. <laughs> yep. Yep, 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 yep. Before Have you, uh... the cloud got to him. <laughs> no. That was not, just, no. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, I was just like, hey, I'm doing video games. Maybe my tag should be something like with my name or like I'm actually like people like, I don't know, see me as something more than just I don't know. So I was just like, I'm going to change my name. And like, find, and it took me like forever to find something that actually 
I wanted something simple like I am Cam. Like, could you imagine if I got I am Cam as my Twitter handle? That'd be so cool. No, nope. nah, Cam Final got... Mix is better. That's good. It's on brand. Yeah, it's, good. yeah, it's, it's got your name on brand. brand. It has my name in it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and the, the final bit of housekeeping this evening, uh, if you are listening to this live or before the weekend, uh, our final MG charity stream is this upcoming Saturday, the 22nd, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. I'll be going for an unspecified amount of time. Usually these go for about 12 hours, but depending on how the drinks are flowing and how the money's flowing for donations, we'll see where things go. The goal is to reach 3,000. We're just over 1,000 now, so... We're trying to hit 3,000 on Saturday. So if you're listening to this live or later before Saturday, or if you're listening to it Saturday, you're like, shit, what am I doing? Pause this shit, come hang out on the stream, and let's raise some money. So uh, make sure to check out that. And obviously, if you listen to this later and you miss the stream, the donation page will stay open until November. So you do have time still to donate after the fact. Help us reach our goal and help us find a cure for MG. But with all that stuff aside... Let's get to the real reason we're all here, which is, of course, to talk about Soul Hackers. But before we even get into Soul Hackers, I figure a good baseline to let the listeners know, like, maybe, you know what? Maybe I don't know Michael. Maybe I don't know Cam. Maybe if you listen to the show, you know who Cam is. I don't know where the fuck you've been. I don't know what episodes (laughs) you're listening to because he's on like every fourth episode. Um, Or if you don't if you're not familiar with Lucas's work or or Lucas's opinions, this is a good baseline to kind of see where everyone's at. So I'm just going to throw it out there. You don't have to think too hard about it. This isn't a quiz. This isn't a test. You know, your opinion can change after the show. Michael, what's your favorite JRPG of all time? That's such a hard question. I know. I know. We... It's yeah. a, You're all getting it. So pre- <laughs> start thinking. Hmm. Uh, no, I think, uh, well, it's um, it d- depends on what, what day you ask me. Some exactly. days I'll say Persona, Persona 5 Royal. Some days I'll say Final Fantasy 14 in its entirety. Um, and it's like I said at the start of the show, it's funny that we're doing this on the eve of Persona 5 mm-hmm. Royal coming out on all platforms around the world. Um, so, you know, that's that game. You know, I think I grew up with the JRPGs, Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Final Fantasy 4 and mm-hmm. 6 were like some of the most formative games. Like those games taught me how to read mm-hmm. uh, like, you know, I was I was tearing it up at the Scholastic Book Club, like in elementary <laughs> school. They're like, damn, how do you know how to read so good? I'm like. Let me tell you all about JRPGs. Uh, no, it's because, like, you know, back in the day, the, there's no quest logs. If you want to find out where to go, you need to talk to NPCs. You really mm-hmm. need to understand what what characters are saying to you and, like, mm-hmm. the dialogue is going on. So um, that's why I had such a strong attachment to the genre at such a young age. Uh, but I say Persona 5 because it was kind of like a reinvention for me um, mm-hmm. where, you know, RPGs are just a part of my life that I've always accepted. And I just never really thought about it too much. I was just like, you know, I want to play good RPGs, but that was a game that really, it came at a time when I was was still early at GameSpot and was still kind of a st- trying to establish a voice, trying to figure out like, how do I move around this industry? And I was moving to a new city, um, but Persona 5 really like grounded me and really uh, put a lot of things in my life into perspective mm-hmm. in a way that I did not expect because I had like, I hadn't had too much history, even though I played uh, JRPGs, I didn't have too much of a history with Shin Megami Tensei as a whole. Uh, so Persona 5 was kind of my intro, like my full introduction to Atlas, and yeah, that that game, like like I said, put a lot of things of my life into perspective. And and like I, Lucy James reviewed it for us at the time, the original version. I was like, oh okay, I'll I'll check this out. And then little did I know that that, that would kind of dictate the way I moved, like the the things I was interested in. I got back into anime in a big way. Uh, and I checked out other games like Persona. I was having conversations with people like, hey, like I really dig this. Like, what should I? folks were like, put me on a four, put me on Persona three. Uh, I played Persona Q that year also. Uh, I checked out, I went back and played the old Shin Megami Tensei games. Um, and then um, from there, it's like Nier, Yakuza, all the other Final Fantasies that I had missed. Uh, kind of like kickstarted this interest in the wider genre. So I think in terms of impact, it's definitely up there with me. And not only is it like my favorite game of all time, but it's also like the one of the most meaningful life changing games for me. And it's uh that I'm I'm that I know other people who have felt similarly. So mm-hmm. I'm not the only one uh out there. No, hundred percent. I mean I like you said, my my game would change probably depending on the day or depending on yeah. what I'm feeling or what 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 the the mood I'm in that I, I want to say like game define me. But Persona 5, specifically Royal, 
uh like that that's a for me that's a in my top 10 uh that yes. like that is that is a game that is very very special to me um but Cam, what about you? What is what is your favorite JRPG of all time? I feel like this is a slam dunk, easy question. It's it's we all know the answer. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows. The, like li- like yeah, everyone knows this answer. Like it's you know it's trails I'm in the sky. Saying, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> shit. Uh, trails in the sky is so good. Um, anyway, but yeah, it's Kingdom Hearts too. You know, of course. Like, uh, yeah, this uh, you know, and granted, like we can talk about the whole like oh, Kingdom Hearts fans are people that like grew up with it and like oh, they had like a, you know, uh, like a not ideal upbringing like whatever it may be and like this like did you say you know, a like, non-ideal upbringing yeah that is that like uh a that's pillar? a <laughs> is that a pillar oh, of yeah. like the people, kingdom hearts community oh, yeah. i didn't know people that like oh yeah people like stereotype like kingdom hearts fans as people who like uh you know it, it was their childhood so they see it through that like that childhood lens or you know they that they had like you know bad bad or not ideal at the very least um experiences at home and like kingdom hearts was like hmm. a game that like kind of oh, okay through okay. that like those tough times and it's true it's true but like it's more than it's more than just that it just it's similar to like uh what michael said about persona 5 royal like it made me re like it made me rethink the way i think about life it made me rethink about how I like think about things like how I um, interact with people, how I view like um, the world and like, and you know, and it's, um, and there are like things, you know, in the story that um, especially in the like later portion that gets a little, a little, a little, a little wild, Mm -hmm. but like, especially like the, like basically like the first game leading up to birth by sleep, is just some of the best story stuff that I've experienced in games still to this day. And uh, I just love the characters and like how I love how, and I'm, and this is a case I feel like for a lot of JRPGs, but I feel like Kingdom Hearts even more so that there's always that care, like a character that, that like sticks with you. Like if you like, if you like, like, if you love Kingdom Hearts, like you're gonna have one of those characters in that cast be like one of your favorite, if not your favorite character in all of video games. Like they, you always just there's always someone that's gonna stick with you. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think that yeah, I just think that um, it's an incredible franchise. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, I can get why it's hard for people to get to get into the series. You know, um, it isn't for everybody, um, and I get that. But um, for those that take the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm very stereotypical to say this because I'm a very, like, you know, for me, when it comes to games, I'm very impatient. Like, if the game doesn't get me hooked in pretty quickly, I'm like, you know, it, it kind I'm kind of like, uh, I'll just drop it and go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Kingdom Hearts is a franchise that you do have to, I, I believe, um, especially now with how many games there are, you have to put in the effort to commit to it. Um, but, and I personally believe that if you do commit to it, and you just like kind of take things for what they are, um, you're gonna experience some, something special. So, yeah, I'm I'm very slowly making my way through those games. Eventually, I'll get to two. I'm I'm I need to really try to play whatever the Game Boy one is called. I forget Chain what it's called. Memories. Chain of Memories. I need to like really sit down and give it a shot because I played through one last year for the first time. And you're right. I mean, one is a little dated. I mean, it is an old game. It's a PS1 game. You got to go in with that lens. I think you got to do that when you revisit any old game, especially if you don't have the nostalgia for it. Um, but I think, you know, true good games do shine through that, even if the gameplay is dated or whatever it may be. Um, but that brings us to you, Lucas. And I don't, I, I don't know this answer. Like, I feel like I could have guessed Michael's and I definitely knew Cam's, but I don't, I don't know your answer, Lucas. And I'm very curious. Yeah, I got kind of kind of caught off guard. The, you guys' answers got really serious real quick. <laughs> it doesn't have like, to oh, go yeah, that way. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it got me, it got me thinking. Um, and like, I, you know, I, I, I've been around for a while. I played most of like the PS One games and everything. Um, but I would say that, in terms of like playing a game that like hits a switch and like know changes the way you think about games and, and stuff uh it's it's got to be dragon quest 9 on the ds um 
that was one of the first times that I really like dove into a, a dragon quest and, and, and the first time I dove into one that was like newer and it was also one of the first times I really dove into a JRPG outside of like Pokemon that like wasn't you know kind of dark and broody and edgy and uh, it was really striking to me um, that Every time you go to a town in that game, it's like a new story starts. Uh, it's very like almost anthology style. Like there's still like the big plot, um, but you know it's Dragon Quest. You like you gotta kill the big bad guy. But every time you go into a new town, there's like a whole entire miniature story start to finish, um, and it's usually like someone has like just this really big problem, and you just happen to solve it or someone is having an existential crisis and you just kind of like sit back and basically watch them deal with it. Um, and that sort of like small scale storytelling um, that did go to some serious places at times, um, but it was so like bright and colorful and dopey and all the monsters have like really stupid faces and they're called like cruel cumber and shit like that. <laughs> I was like just a couple of years out of high school when that came out and that really unlocked like a greater sense of like what what you can do with tone in a story you know it's, it's really easy when you're when you're that age to like get wrapped up in like the, the edgier stuff mm -hmm. you know i'm watching like an elf and lead and i'm reading frank miller comics and that's what the good shit is when you're 16 years old and then this game comes and sort of like unlocks the other half for me mm -hmm. um, and yeah i don't think i've really looked back since um also it's got like the dopest job system of all time <laughs> in nine like, specifically or dragon quest in general nine specifically um Ooh. they always kind of mix it up for each game um but in nine, it basically just like lets you do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It's like you can choose fighter and you level that up and it gets its own little set of skill points. But then you can move it over and keep all those extra skill points. And so you can just have one character go through the whole fucking list of classes and get everything and just because you feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, and that ended up being something I really clicked with and I think led me to really appreciating stuff like saga uh much later down the line where it's like you just have these characters and you can just tinker with them until you're sick of it um mm -hmm. so yeah um you know I, I love earthbound uh love persona 3 uh lunar 2 kind of has a soft spot in in my heart um love mystery dungeon uh but i, I think i think garden quest 9 is the top dog i'm i'm loving these answers across the board everyone's got you know emotional spiritual attachment to these games and you know it's kind of across the board we got we got atlas we got kingdom hearts we got dragon quest uh so you know we're hitting hitting the top atlas square enix um knocking it out of the park I, i'll be brief with mine because mine's not as uh fantastical my his my my history in in lifetime with jrpgs ebbs and flows um like it's hard for me to not say pokemon red simply because that was my first rpg you know mm -hmm. 1997 maybe six i don't remember exactly um i got it the following year for christmas and it was like the first that i can remember that's the first jrpg that i had ever played um and that introduced me to the genre and it got me to you know care about something that previously i never knew about like i never had the opportunity to play uh you know that would eventually lead to things like super mario rpg which is probably my favorite rpg um simply because i'm a nintendo boy i love mario and that took something that i always loved and introduced all of these other elements that previously didn't exist. It gave humor. It gave more life to some of these other characters that previously you didn't control. 
you didn't really see much of other than I'm going to rescue the princess. I'm going to beat Bowser. Now it's all these people are hanging out. Gino, my guy, Mallow, I yeah. love you. Yeah. Like Gino and Mallow. Oh my God. Come back somewhere, please. Um, but I, that, that game is, is special to me. And it was one of those things where, again, like I grew up, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money. They spent, you know, they worked hard, both of them to like provide for, I'm, I'm one of five kids. So like, everything they did was like for us and they were always trying to provide for us and get us the things we wanted and stuff. But like, you know, money is, is finite and we didn't have money to just buy any video game we had. So I never had Super Mario RPG when I was a kid. One of my friends had it and that's where I played it. And then I discovered ROMs at like a, you know, young teenager. And I'm like, Whoa, I can, I can play this game myself now. Finally, uh, Door Nintendo. I do own the game now in multiple ways, including a physical cart for my Super Nintendo because you gotta have it. I also have a case in box Super yeah. Famicom oh, version because this this snap. right here, this is this is my game. Oh, hell yeah. I do have my actually I do have my original copy of Pokemon Red too, because again, these games are like formative to me. They 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 yeah. They molded me from a young age, so those were, like, my big things. And I played JRPGs throughout, like, you know, I wasn't a big Final Fantasy person up until, like, my history of Final Fantasy is very bizarre. Like, Crystal Chronicles is one of my favorite games just because, like, oh, yeah. it, it's, I don't think it's a good game to in now standards, and that port was not good. I don't know if they ever fixed it. Um, but, like, that was me and my buddies had those shitty Game Boy Advance adapters and we sat around the GameCube and played that shit for hours. Um, and I played a lot of like, you know, action RPGs like Champions of Norath and stuff like that. Like it wasn't until a little bit later that I started to like Wild Arms 2. Again, very bizarre game for me to kind of latch on to, but like that's a game that's important to me. Um, and then later, you know, kind of getting into some other stuff, but I, I Kind of to like what what Michael was saying earlier, like Persona 5 Royal changed things for me. And that kind of like was a weird reintroduction to JRPGs and that made me care about certain things more and, you know, led me to play Yakuza Like a Dragon, which I still need to go play the rest of the Yakuza games now because Like a Dragon fucked me up. And uh, yeah. I don't know. And, and, and to, a, to a different degree, because I have specific feelings about this game. Final Fantasy VII Remake was my first time playing Final Fantasy, and I fucking, Whoa. like, it made me then go play Final Fantasy VII, the original game, well, you know, the port on Switch, so I could fast forward, because fuck, um, but I mean, I love that game too, like, it's just, I got introduced to it, you know, much later time, obviously, um, but anyways, this has been the JRPG Power Hour, so now you have a background to all of us clowns and what, what we <laughs> love about JRPGs, so... Let's get a little bit into Soul Hackers. I think off the top, everyone has played the first Soul Hackers game besides me. I'm the I'm the odd man out here with y'all have played. Is it Devil Summon or Soul Hackers? Is that what the original game is called? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yep. So, what what is kind of everyone's you know expectations going into Soul Hackers two? Like, was was Soul Hackers a game that? all of y'all had fondness for or were, ex were like excited shit we're getting whole soul hackers too like is it is that a is that a temperature check like where are we at with you know kind of this game getting announced and coming out in relation to how everyone feels about soul hackers i mean i knew what soul hackers was when soul hackers 2 was announced but mm -hmm. i didn't um you know i i at that like at that point i had i hadn't played it but i was like slowly i've been slowly buying all of atlas's like or most of atlas's 3ds library because they have a stellar 3ds library for those listening mm -hmm. um and i was kind of like that's kind of unexpected because this game is super old and you know like granted i got a remake on the 3ds but it's like this is a sega saturn game that's like and it, they're rebooting it and it looks completely different in tone and like style that the first game was and um but like you know for me like out of all the alice games i have played like alice doesn't miss so i was just like okay this is gonna be this is gonna be good like you know i'm gonna enjoy my time with this game um so that, that that's where i was at like going into it mm. from i was 
yo, when they announced this, <laughs> I was so hyped. I think because for me, the perception was that, you know, Persona had broken to the mainstream and Atlas has this huge backlog of obs- kind of obscure shit that is genuinely very good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that it, it felt like they had an opportunity to kind of kickstart some of their older brands, modernize them and reintroduce them to an audience who got into their games via Persona, uh, who probably, you know, didn't, nece- didn't necessarily feel like doing the work of going back to a PS2 era of batch of video games. But uh, I did because I was, after P5, I was like, I'm playing SMT3. I'm playing SMT4 for Apocalypse. I'm doing the three, three and four, uh, uh, the Persona games. And uh, so I was like deep in it, like, oh, I'm going to play the OG versions. Uh, and Soul Hackers was one of them because, uh, you know, we bring the Shin Megami Tensei foundation to a sci-fi cyberpunk setting Mm. i feel like that there's infinite possibilities um so and like i I, having played soul hackers one it it, it was just like this really bizarre sort of game like it's it definitely felt like well because it was originally a saturn game from the from 1997 and retained a lot of that and i think that that's a good thing is that they kind of like preserve that that style of game but you know it's it's rough around the edges if you play it today, but I, I got it. I understood like what it was going for. Mm-hmm. Um, so when Soul Hackers 2 was announced, like I was blowing up my timeline on Twitter. I was like, yo, this is going to be the dopest shit ever. <laughs> uh, and like when folks was playing it at a SGF uh, earlier this year at a summer game fest, I was, I was heated because I wasn't there. I didn't go, uh, but people were on the ground. They were playing uh, the demo that was available there. And I was like, damn, how am I not there playing playing uh, Soul Hackers 2? <laughs> so going into it, I had uh, very high hopes, uh, which you know turned out they were kind of misplaced. But that's neither here nor there. Um, but I think that you know, especially with because coming, I the last Atlas game I played going into Soul Hackers 2 was Shin Megami Tensei 5. I feel like that was a great game. That was like one of my top games of 2021. I felt very strongly about it. You know, they took it in a slightly different direction, but it retained the Shin Megami Tensei, uh, like the the vibe and the, the the spirit of core SMT and modernized it in smart ways and still felt like a classic JRPG. Like it stuck to its roots, yet brought it to a new audience on Switch. And I was like, yo, this if this is the ethos that they're moving forward with, with their other games, yo, bring back Devil Survivor, bring back Devil Summoner, bring back Soul Hackers, bring back all that stuff. Um, so I, and I felt like, oh, Soul Hackers 2 was like the first step in doing that sort of thing. So, you know, I did have high hopes going into it. Yeah. What about you, Lucas? Do you have strong feelings about it beforehand or? Yeah. So I was really confused. Um, you know, I, I probably got into the series, um, a little earlier than you guys. Um, and when I get into something, I just dive in, you know, reading the Wikipedia mm-hmm. articles and everything. So <laughs> So I kind of like I was aware of the series and the sub series and the history and blah blah blah. So seeing it presented as like Soul Hackers Two was really weird, um, because you know it's it's part of that the uh, Devil Summoner series, um, and it's it's kind of related to like the way Atlas USA has been like using the Shin Megami Tensei brand for all of it. Uh, Japan hasn't been doing that, um, but Devil Summoner had been a thing pretty consistently, at least through the PS2 until it stopped. Um, so I was like, "What are they doing? What, what are they trying to say here by by taking all the other labeling off?" Um, which is weird because, like, on the 3DS, it's Shin Megami Tensei colon Devil Summoner colon Soul Hackers, um, and like Cam mentioned, it looks completely different. Um, and so I wasn't sure if they were just like trying to like experiment with the branding again for the third or fourth time. You got a, I don't know if y'all can see this. It's cool. Yeah. Revelations the Demon Slayer is a Megami <laughs> Tensei game. You wouldn't know that if you saw it on the shelf. Um, so they, they've tried all kinds of weird stuff. Um, So I, I I think just to put it shortly, I I just like I was like, what are they doing? This is weird. I'm intrigued, but I just 
mostly just confused. So I want to see what this is. Mm-hmm. For for me, it was kind of a a mix of things. One being like Atlas has always been that thing that's kind of been on my periphery. Like I know people enjoy their games. I know that they have some high quality JRPGs, other things. And a lot of my experience with uh, Atlas up until P five was. I for some reason played I mean because I'm a fighting game psycho I played Persona 4 Arena like and without having really any ties to Persona I played um Catherine which you know has its issues but I personally enjoy that game um yeah and I feel like there's another Atlas game that's not really in a, a JRPG that I'm like forgetting about oh Trauma Center like Trauma I, Center yeah yeah hey. like <laughs> like I've I've played plenty Tokyo of Atlas Mirage games Session? uh to- oh, yeah Tokyo Mirage Sessions is, is uh, another one that I never finished, but I do have that on my Wii U and my Switch. Oh, um, but like I, I've I have been aware and I've dabbled. And after Persona Five kind of captured my heart, you know, pun intended, I guess. Um, I was excited because I was like, okay, Persona Five, and then Royal took the mainstream. It took Atlas to the mainstream. It broke them out of their core audience. It, you know, coming out of a couple of years where we're having a lot of mainstream JRPGs like Yakuza Like a Dragon, Persona 5, and Royal. Obviously Final Fantasy VII Remake. Like, we're kind of getting this moment of more people who maybe aren't usually playing JRPGs are getting that in their face. Uh, SMT5 Switch exclusive that was a big push when that game came out like a lot of games were kind of getting in the in the forefront so to me I was like okay they're bringing out Soul Hackers 2 you know kind of to what Lucas was saying they dropped the other branding away from it maybe they're trying to build this as a third pillar like we have Shimagami Tensei we have Persona and now we have Soul Hackers maybe this is like going to be a really good game because they're trying to maybe lean in as like a third you know we have Shin Megami Tensei, that's a little bit darker, you know, demon focus, you know, all this stuff. Persona is like a whole different type of vibe. Obviously, it has this, they all have the same things. Like, they're all the same game. They just have, like, a different coat of paint over them for the most part. Like, different mechanics in some ways. But, you know, Persona's high school kid dealing with this stuff. And, you know, then we got Soul Hackers, which is cyberpunk, you know, adults, all these things. And... Drinking beer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I was super excited for this game and and um you know for me personally it was like one of the first like this was probably one of the bigger games that I for myself got a code for early so I was like fucking let's go like I'm fucking reviewing an Atlas game like before this shit's yeah. coming out are you fucking kidding me right now um and like I think overall I'm on I'm on a personally I don't like uh, put numbers to my thoughts and reviews this is probably a solid seven ish for me. Like it's not a bad game. It's definitely not like, especially coming out of, again, these last few years where we've had, in my opinion, like benchmark JRPGs, persona five, Yakuza like a dragon, final fantasy seven remake, though not maybe a little bit more action RPG, but like we've had benchmark titles that I think have like changed the genre, reintroduced people to the genre. This is clearly not that, which isn't necessarily a strike against it, but it does need to be said in the, in an age where we are getting these titles, you know, that is definitely part of the conversation. So I was a little, you know, not sad, but like, I think the game fell flat in a lot of places for me. There were still a lot of things I did enjoy about it, but uh, we can kind of get into some of those things. Um, so like with the overall, just, you know, vibe and story of the game, how is everyone kind of feeling about, just what's going on in this in this game uh i guess um i well the where do i start because like there there's when i play when i played through soul hackers 2 Mm -hmm. it was i had two impressions of it like when you're walking when you actually when you're out in the city and you see the backdrops and you hear the music and the l- bright lights flashing it's like my mind is going wild with the possibilities of you know the atmosphere the the cyberpunk atmosphere is so intriguing to me mm-hmm. and especially you know when i think about 
you know, not that it's supposed to be in the same sense as Yakuza, but it's go you're going to a lot of locations in Tokyo that are, you know, that we see reflected in the Yakuza franchise. So like having come off that, it's like, oh man, I can't wait to unravel all the different stories that are going to be going on in this wild city. Mm -hmm. And there, there are touches of that. Like when you have the conversations at the bar where they are talking about, you know, the, their place in society, the like social aspects of the world that they live in and, you know, capitalism and stagnation, all this other stuff. It, they, they touch on interesting things that kind of set the tone for the rest of the world, but they don't do anything with it. And, and so I think that was, that was one aspect that I was uh, pretty disappointed in, but in terms like, but you don't necessarily have to go hard on those aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, is especially if you're character focused. So the thing for me that kind of like I tr- I tried very hard to vibe with the game is through its cast, but I like I feel like I know what Soul Hackers Two is trying to do in that you don't have to go through the whole preamble of you know hours of storytelling to get to know the characters, and it's very apparent in the early hours. Like, boom, you meet this person, this is their deal. Boom, you meet this person, they're in your party. Meet this person, this is their deal. Now they're in your party cool four of you are together let's go and Mm -hmm. that like i respect that decision the the problem for me was that it still didn't give enough time or it didn't have the hook for each character so by the time they were already pushing you through to kind of solve the mystery and you know carry on the fight that they're that they all care about they're all fighting for i just didn't have a good grasp of their motivations who they are what drives them and you go through like the soul matrix and you learn more about them um but I think that it felt like the game was presuming, like they assumed that you had already had attachment to these characters, mm-hmm. in which I didn't. So those, you know, the 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 heavy the things that are supposed to be heavy hitting didn't land. So um it felt like for me, like throughout playing the game, I kept trying to find something to grasp, something to vibe with, something that was going to be like, oh damn, like this is, you know, other things can be fairly mediocre, or whatever, but you know, this is the thing that I'm going to latch onto because there are a lot of RPGs that I love dearly that are like sevens. Like if you put them on a scale or whatever, like they're okay games, but there's something that I will remember this game for, like yeah. whatever it may be. Like, I mean, I do love tra- tra- Trails games are fantastic and I love them. They're definitely better than seven. Cam and I have opinions <laughs> about Trails games. We love Trails games. Um, but when I think about Trails, like there's there's something about them that uh, like latches onto, like even if it's something like, you know sky first chapter is does a lot of establishing and it's not necessarily like the most exciting thing in the world but damn is that game just like written very very sharply and has a lot of personality mm-hmm. in the places you go in the core characters so you know everything else could be like good standard rpg stuff but i'm gonna remember that game for you know estelle and josh when they're like struggle whatever and establishing those characters um the thing when i look back like especially preparing for this podcast and i look back at soul hackers too like huh what is the thing that i remember most about it ringo's character design is really cool like (laughs) i don't i don't i don't know there's there's like it, it feels like they played it very safe yeah, uh, it's like let's make a very like a lot of a lot of folks have said who were playing it said, oh, this reminds me of the PS2 era of RPGs, and that's cool. And I like, like I, I definitely have room in my life for something like that. That's super. I'm playing my fucking Steam Deck is loaded with PS2 RPGs, and I'm <laughs> loving it. Um, but again, like those games have something, uh, have something to latch onto. So yeah. I guess too, just I don't think it went in any one direction hard enough. Yeah. I, I agree with you and like to kind of jump in real quick when I was also thinking about like what, what are the things that like you know we're about two months out from when this game came out and even longer from when we all played it I'm sure so what what is the thing that like I'm resonated with me and I don't think it's even top of its class if not even anything remarkable but it's the gameplay for me which isn't necessarily a bad thing that if that's the thing that sticks with me um but it's still not as good as some other games that I do enjoy. But that that was like the thing. Like I did enjoy that loop. I liked going into the Soul Matrix. I wish the Soul Matrix was more fleshed out in certain ways. Like again, it's hard to not compare it to, especially another Atlas game like Persona Five Royal, where it's like those dungeon designs felt deliberate. Mementos obviously is you know similar to what the Soul Matrix is, but it still felt 
a little more robust in some way. I, I don't I don't know. I'm sick of fucking those teleporters. I don't want to go in these teleporters anymore. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like. I don't know. It it did hit a certain point. That gameplay loop of just the battling was good and concise, and you, you remove like the all out attacks and replace it with uh, sabbaths. Sabbath, and yeah. you know, building those combos up felt rewarding to me. Like it it it, it hit that like goop part of my brain that you know was satisfied yeah. by <laughs> that, and that was kind of what was pulling me through the game to be honest. Because kind of like to what you said, Michael, I wasn't really like for better or for worse. They push you through the beginning of that game. They just give you the party. They expect you to care about their motivations. Like, to the point where it was like, I remember certain at lines of dialogue that were just like, so you're not even going to question anything that's going on. You're just going to immediately party up with this person, and it's like, we're good to go. I'm just like, I'm again, I'm, I'm not mad about it necessarily because one of my probably bigger issues with Persona 5 in general is... A, a char- like later introduced characters to your party I typically didn't really play with them like I did finish their social links and stuff but I didn't have the same like ca- like I didn't care about um I don't even can't remember her name uh who's Haru? last Haru I can't put I, like, some respect listen, on her I, name <laughs> Haru, Haru is Haru, I, I'm pro Haru like Haru, Me too. Haru I, gets too much listen too I don't much have time. I don't have like listen Haru's fine but like Haru didn't hit like Makoto and Ryuji yeah. are are my my crew. Like th- like I played through that game almost entirely, except for certain situations. Like Makoto, or always Makoto. For, it doesn't even matter if it was not the right choice. <laughs> Makoto's always there. Um, Makoto Ryuji like in 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 Morgana because Morgana has to be there. But I love Morgana and all the Mar- Morgana haters out there. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so like Cam Lucas, how are you guys feeling about like the overall like, kind of vibes? you know, story presentation of this game. So I think the whole, like, I'm confused about what this is, was a really big part of the beginning. Mm. Um, so I was like, is this a soft reboot? Is it a sequel? What, like, is this connected to the other games? Is it not? Uh, and like a lot of the beginning was like, just kind of going through and taking the, introductory stuff at like face value basically just to like just to get through and like figure out what's going on um and at one point i kind of like went back and like looked at soul hackers and and looked at uh, devil summoner and just just sort of was like what is what is this series doing holistically that like justifies this thing's existence um and it finally clicked with me the other day. I was like, oh, this is a cautionary tale about the metaverse. The, the whole legs thing happened. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's what this whole thing is about. That's interesting. But that's all like external stuff. Yeah. Um, you, you have this whole thing about like it being a warning as like a series of like, don't let the shady rich people take over like human creativity is like a uh, i don't want to say concept but I'm not losing the words but the, the whole thing is like the previous game is like we have this digital city and this big vr game and you can go watch movies and sit in beach chat rooms but it's actually like a vehicle for a, a secret society to like suck people's souls out and then you kind of like fast forward hundreds of years and it's like uh, those people just run things now and everyone gave up on like mm-hmm. trying anything so now you have these two like factions beating each other up so they don't they don't even really understand why anymore um and that kind of plays off of the the other like the the coat of paint as you put it um the devil summoner games are like what if demons are around, but also human society is still like functioning? Mm. You got Shimigami, it's post apocalyptic. Humans are just like brain juice for demons. They're kind of figuring that out. And then there's uh, Persona, is like a high school mystery mm. anime kind of thing, but it's more about like characters solving their like own problems. And this is like, what if humans are just being humans, but they can like summon, you know, nuclear warheads out of their little computers and the answer ultimately becomes oh they 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 fuck it up and 
like they're all gonna die anyways because like capital took over um so it's like there's it's just like the whole purpose is like this is a dead end for humans and the technology that you decided to just sort of like uh detach your like responsibility from is now saving you which i think is kind of weird to think about Mm -hmm. um but like the game itself doesn't like all that stuff is kind of on the outside and it's interesting Mm -hmm. to think about um but that didn't really kind of happen for me until after i played the game um and there were like little bits and pieces of it um, and there were parts i really liked but it was mostly about like the characters interacting with each other for me um and like michael said it was like you have to you have to basically be like oh okay i guess i'll be on board mm-hmm. before like the good stuff happens um so yeah i i guess my my whole takeaway is like it sure did send me on a really fun wikipedia rabbit <laughs> what about you cam um yeah i i uh agree agree with you brendan that i think uh this is like a seven is where i would put this game as well um i generally uh liked it it was just uh very repetitive um even for a jrpg like very you know lack of design when it came to the dungeons um they were very samey not even the soul matrix just like you know there's like five or six dungeons subway lines yeah yeah hallways (laughs) yeah and and most of them are subway lines and it's just like come on and just like i I think when i saw the whole like made in unity on the actual splash screen like you could tell pretty early on that this that this game just didn't have a, a high budget um and you can see that when you continue playing through the game that there was just like a lack of budget um but for what the for the resources that they had like i um i like the i like the story quite a bit um i just think that um they didn't have enough time to flesh certain things out um because i'm one of those people like i actually liked that we got all the party members like within the opening hours because yeah i don't hate that either arguably mm-hmm. arguably like my least favorite thing about persona is that like i feel like in in a lot of cases um at least like comparing to persona three through five the characters that i get near near the like the last character or two i get at the end of uh, each one are the ones i tend to like not really get enough time with to to spend to really um you know uh like like them the way i do a lot of the other characters that i spend much more time with yeah like haru um, so, no haru <laughs> haru's, haru's the, the exception who, who's the yeah. who's the second to last in five i can't remember now uh, uh f- it's, it's futaba isn't is it the it? Oh, futaba. Futaba, yeah 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 but um guy and i think a big part with futaba like and, and here's a i mean i don't want to get in tangent but like uh, yeah haru i thought they like knowing the behind the scenes things with haru and stuff i think they did a good job with her but anyway um and i think that um i i actually i mean i didn't really care that much for arrow but i really liked saito and melody uh, and melody i really liked their characters um i liked i liked saito's like i not that i particularly agreed with it but like i i I dug his like viewpoint of the world, especially the world that they were existing in. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, it was just something that I could really like just understand. And it's like, um, and, and just not like particularly relate to, but I just like, I was like, I get this. Like, you know, there's definitely times where um, I I think there's, there's times where like kind of everyone feels this way. um, And he just feels this way all the time um and you know learning about um melody's background and you know why the way she is i i i really i really i really dug it um and i think uh i think the main thing that really uh 
I, I, I just didn't get enough time with was um, everything that led up to Fig and her, like, you know, uh, everything, you know, her deciding that she's going to kind of destroy everything and, and uh, herself because of what happened. And it was like one of those things, like, it was unexpected, but I understood it. But also, like, I wish that there was more time to like flush it out. I felt like it was too much of a, it was too quick of a, of a flip switch for me. Yeah. Where I was just like, I wish that they not particularly hinted at it more, but I just wish that they gave us more time to kind of stew in like where she was at and like why she was thinking this way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was kind of thrown to us all at once. Um, And then at that point it was like, all right, here's the final dungeon and you got to take her out um so yeah it, it's one of it, it's one of those things where it because i think that soul hackers to the the goal of what atlas was trying to do was to make a jrpg that's more digestible mm -hmm. uh because Definitely. i feel like persona is like very intimidating shimigami tensei is not for everyone because it's purposefully difficult um you know more than most jrpgs that they wanted something to be a little bit more casual a little bit more uh slim uh, simplistic mm -hmm. and uh and use soul hackers 2 as that third pillar right um for that but um you know when it got to that point like you know near the end um with i forgot the dude's name but you know uh raven 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 uh with raven and everything i just think that that part went too fast and that was definitely the most interesting part of the main story yeah and then we just like and then we're just like oh we're going to the final boss now or the final dungeon i was just like oh fuck well i want to learn i need more here like you know like i love i really loved raven and fig's con uh fig's conversation like i knew what he i knew he was gonna say no like i knew like there's like this is gonna be the time where like the they're gonna be like nope i don't want to come back and that but that still that didn't stop that conversation from being interesting because i was just like you know i wanted to hear why like his like his mindset behind it and and, and all, all that stuff and like how fig was going to react to it and it was again it was just too too quick of a like a uh a flip switch because um you know i think that a lot of this game is just like these two you know humanoid constructs uh trying to understand what it is to be human right mm -hmm. what is human emotion what is you know and like fig is like during this whole part with raven like she's experiencing love right and really like her her reaction at the end of the day is due to heartbreak and um how like and there just wasn't yeah it, it, there just wasn't enough time to like because they spend so much time uh, especially with like the the beer conversations you know the drinking conversations talking about um the you know ringo learning these different experiences of of what it is of what humans deal with and like whether it be something very simplistic or something much more uh complex you know they didn't give fig that time um at the end and i think that that was what really heard it even though like I, I i get the whole you know heartbreak can can make people blind right but mm -hmm. i think that there is still an argument that just for the sake of time like they're just they, they just there just needed to be more to flush out there and i think yeah. that they just didn't give it uh give it that time so yeah mm -hmm. i think to that point uh like i think about and what we've mentioned this is that soul, how soul, soul Hackers 2 moves pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And like you can appreciate that aspect. And it was about like a 40 hour game. And you know, now that Brendan is mentioning Yakuza Like a Dragon, and I think think about my time with that game, I finished that game in 40 hours also. It's I power I did power through it for review, uh, but I did like, you know, 40 to 50 hours. So a similar length almost. And I really think about how Soul Hackers 2 spends its time. Mm -hmm. 
like they spend a lot of time talking about nothing in a lot of the group conversations. And when I think about Yakuza Like a Dragon, even the mundane interactions between all the characters says something about them and who they like, you know, that like y- Namba and um, Ichiban like having a drink in their apartment, you know, they have a conversation about something real or when Psycho wants to like go to the grocery store or something and like cook a meal for everybody like. There, there's something there about that, that says something about each character. Whereas with Soul Hackers too, when you know when they go back to the high down, they talk to each other. They, uh, they, just, they, they, they don't necessarily touch on anything that says something about who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think so. The thing is that Soul Hackers two just spends its time in the wrong places. Is I think what comes down to it because like as Cam and I, I feel the same way with Cam, in that like there's there's something missing. It feels like you know. The, the conclusions that they reach aren't necessarily bad like this like like there's nothing necessarily bad about the game but it's just there's a disconnect between what happens and how you get there mm-hmm. um and yeah and then when i think about i spent a lot of time just like going through these subway lines and these dungeons and the soul matrix like what if those things were condensed and you know and the times that they had conversations i feel like you know spent you know kind of rewrote rewrote some of that dialogue to be more expressive to have more personality uh, so by the time you get to these big uh conclusions like you don't have to make the mental jumps and the mental loops to jump jump through to be like oh okay that was her motivation i think yeah um because yeah this, i feel the same like by the time like it wasn't until after when i figured out, like why does fig care about raven again like what um it's like oh yeah, yeah exactly. that does that does make sense that you know an entity a humanoid entity experiencing love for the first time you know how do they but cope how did with she that? get there but how did she get there yeah they yes didn't, they yeah it, it was very much a jump and i was just like wait i mean what? that dude is fine as fuck i'm not gonna lie <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> raven is yeah. hot so i get it like um, it, it would have been more it would have made more sense if she was just upset that there was just like another person like that's being affected by all this but like one it's like he's the bad guy so not really that doesn't make sense and also just like yeah it, it, and also it, it wouldn't justify your actions at the very end of the game so it's just like it was a very yeah again a, just a huge jump with no real like explanation but then like when but like everything that fig talks about like it it's compelling but it's just like okay but you didn't there was no there was no path that got you here it was yeah. just you just got here it just happens mm-hmm. that, that, yeah. that, that's like i feel like that's the whole game like every aspect of the game really feels like that where it's like wait how did we get here um things just happen like yeah you like, go like, through the like, soul matrix like, and... yeah like the stuff with saito and ash right like they didn't do enough to like when she did does turn good again it's like what like you know like there wasn't enough for that to feel earned you yeah. know in a real mm-hmm. way um you know like i'm happy for y'all but like also just <laughs> like hey how did we get here yeah i think well yeah we're on definitely on the same page with that cam which what stinks too is because like i feel like i feel like the overall thing we can kind of all agree on is like the game is rushed in a lot of ways and it's not necessarily that the game is bad but it feels like it has all of these pieces on the board, but they're not being utilized in the right way. Like I liked the idea of going in the soul matrix. I mean, it's not too different from other games and like going into mementos, going to someone's palace, like the concept of going into someone's soul matrix and like going deeper and unlocking more of their story. It just, it didn't necessarily lead to more strong connection with me and that character where it could have easily been that if, you know, certain dialogue options were different or cutscenes were different or conversations in the hideout or the bar were different. Um, and not to say the game is, like, devoid of all those things because it's not. It's just definitely rushed. I, I think one of the big things for me is the game doesn't really have a villain that I care about or villains that I care about. Like, obviously, again we keep comparing this game to persona like persona very personal stories and struggles for most of the characters and you can kind of whether you have a personal connection to that story like there were certain storylines in persona 5 that personally affected me and attached to my life so 
I could very easily connect to those stories or apply them to my life in some way, and those things resonated with me on a deep level. And not every game needs to do that, and Soul Hacker 2 doesn't need to do that, but I didn't feel really any motivation personally to kind of follow through with the main story of this game. Like, it, it nothing was pulling me along in that way. Um, like, I feel like we didn't get enough about the two, like, organizations, yeah. clans, or whatever. Like, yep. I feel like that was like, yep. here's this thing that exists, but, like, you're never going to deal with them. You're never going to. Yeah. yeah ex- exactly. It was um, very bizarre. That, that's the thing that, like, made the first game, in my opinion, better than the second, is because, like, you are in the middle of it all in a way where you're actually like fight you're fighting the people like the grunts and you get to a boss who is like a lieutenant or something like that that is a like a member of that organization um because basically like the organization that's like the bad guys in Soulhackers one is the is like iron masks like side of things um and yeah, they're like uh, through the whole thing like all the devil summer. yeah um, which is the thing that's interesting to me because it's just like in this one they in two they like there's no good or bad side per se even though like canon or like in the past like this side has been the bad side but um which is a is a change but yeah i think that um yeah that, that was definitely missing um oh god i lost my train of thought and the other things i was gonna say um but uh I think uh, someone else talk because I, I I'm forgetting what I was about to say. Aww. Yeah, I'll go ahead because I disagree with most of you at this point. Um, <laughs> whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa. we need some dissent. Let's do yeah. it. All right, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, so for me, um, I think that things in the story really change when they first get to that orphanage, and. Uh, I don't think it really has that much to do with Raven or the sort of relationship between he and Fig. Um, I noticed as soon as you get there um, and as soon as like the the kids come out and everything, um, like Melody immediately, like she just like her whole front breaks. Like you, you see more, more from Arrow even, who's kind of the straight guy the whole time. Um, and, and it just really seems you, you kind of learn that like their past were really bad um, but that only seems to be like a piece of it but it's basically it's like these people have never really interacted with children in any substantial way in a long time and they immediately just like their facades just kind of start melting away mm-hmm. and that kind of leads into those side conversations a little bit and I think you guys are right in the sense that like they're pretty fluffy, but at the same time, like uh, Arrow and Melody, like the more of those you do, the more they kind of stop just being angry at each other for being on opposite teams, and they start, you know, like like they find out they have something in common, but then they get really mad about it, and then it just kind of keeps going until like they finally sort of like break through, and Ringo basically forces them to be friends. Um, and i guess what i'm getting at is the the thing i was saying earlier about this sort of being the 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 end result of what devil summoner kind of is um which again like it's weird because soul hackers 2 does such a weird job like explaining what it is in the first place um but it's like the, the two sides like you're the fact that you don't really get anything out of that I think is kind of the point because they're so far gone from wanting more or wanting better they're just like keeping this conflict going on forever and ever and ever and there's no like purpose to it mm. and I think through like the orphanage and through learning about like Raven's kind of like PTSD and and uh, Fig kind of she was there more. I, I think like what happens is she like spends more time there or something like when you're separated. Um, there's a lot of stuff about them like making meals for the kids, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the whole 
I think what it gets to is like finding that motivation. Um, like basically this group of people finding a reason to like try to change whatever happens next. Um, and then on Fig's side is she gives up. She sees like this guy is suffering so much. He's completely given up and he's also going to like just chop things off at the head for all these like kids in the orphanage. Um, and that sort of, I think, the way they kind of go about the whole like AI learning how humans work thing, um, it gets to where she's like, well, you know, I'm just gonna remove all that conflict and brainwash everyone or whatever. Um, so I, I I agree in the sense that like it does get through that pretty quickly, um, but I, I also think that the game kind of takes a lot of opportunities to very kind of quietly set the the path to the some of the stuff in ways that aren't like immediate in your face like mm -hmm. in a like in persona where like just everything is just exposition coming out of everyone's mouth at all times um and this it's like look they're like reading stories to these kids and they're they're freaking out because raven doesn't feed them well and and like <laughs> they're just suddenly different people every time there's a scene in this place mm -hmm. and I think it definitely like there's a point where it's just like oh shit we have to end the game uh <laughs> she's a giant data tentacle now i guess um but i think by that point i was a little more invested than i expected to be mm -hmm. um and you know between that and the goop brain from the uh vision soul matrix sorry that also pulled me to, to the finish line yeah for sure and, and i will say like my overall like kind of my like just flat out how i feel about this game probably just as like a elevator pitch of how i feel about this game is oh. i think cam and i have talked about this at some point and if you're listening to this podcast then this is like this comment or this thought or feeling about this game really doesn't matter to you necessarily because if you're listening to this, you're probably not the person that needs to hear this. But my take on this game is like, this is a good introductory Atlas JRPG. Like, if you are curious about Atlas JRPGs, I think this is on the shorter side, like lengthwise. You know, it's not perfect. It's a little messy at points, a little rushed. But it's a lot more digestible than hopping into something like Shin Megami Tensei that is usually more difficult or something like Persona that you know, like when I played Persona 5, it was like a, a long time, like 120 hours plus. Like I put a lot of time into that game. So like not everybody has that time commitment. Maybe people are scared by that time commitment. So, you know, being able to jump into, you know, 30 to 50 hour RPG that kind of hits on some of the similar like overall tones and notes and style and in battle system. This is a way to be like, all right, if I like what this game is doing, then maybe I'm going to love Shin Megami Tensei. Maybe I'm going to love Persona. Um, Cause I think those are probably the better package of this type of game. Um, like, yeah, to interject yeah. real quick. Sorry. I think that is exactly where I had the most trouble. Uh, just enjoying this game um because like i like i understand the digestibility thing but at, at the same time like they've been dropping you know super easy modes into these games for a while now mm -hmm. um so it's like yeah shimigami and tensei can be very hard if you play the older games and leave them on default difficulty but there's like two or three steps under you can do and there's a similar thing here uh, with like the revives on the easiest mode a full transparency to finish this game in time the last boss i absolutely dropped this shit to revive me because 
Yeah. I could not beat that thing, and it was like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I just need to see how this game ends. I just need to see how it ends at this point. I think I tuned it down at one point. I don't really remember, but like, it really just confuses me because they also like drop all the demon negotiation stuff. Um, and I think that's also an attempt to be adjustable, but then like, why, why is the game so weird about like how it's connected to other games? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like what, why, why is it that like, I feel like I got a lot out of the game and it's connection to the other games, but that was work I did on my own. And I don't understand how not having that stuff um, makes it more digestible. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that's a lot of what you guys ran into with like the not feeling the, the, uh, the, the meat and the story is just like, it seems like in trying to make it digestible, they just like took stuff out until they were left with, you know, more of like a, I don't know. I don't even know. It almost reminds me of like Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, where it was like, oh, you know, maybe maybe we need to just like stomp our feet on the foundation a little bit and like kick some of it off, and maybe then maybe then people will come <laughs> to our land of RPGs. Um, but it was just it was just weird in that way. Like like the whole game just really doesn't seem to have like a cohesive um purpose i guess in that way mm -hmm. um so yeah i really just like running through it just being like well this is so weird like i know i'm like a sicko but like the negotiation has always been like the best part even when they you know like the demons are like so pulled out of everything like you don't even see them in combat until the end of the turn it's, it's just like it's the weirdest things that they they took out with i think uh an honest attempt to make it more accessible but i just i think it was a real misfire i just think that if they again and, and i don't know this obviously but i think that there are plenty of signs in the game that this game had a very low budget compared to Persona 5, Shin Megami Tensei 5, um, you know, to the point where, like, I think that if this game had more money backing it, it would have turned out better. Um, or, like, in the future, if they put more money into Soul, a Soul Hackers 3, it'll turn out better. Um, because, like, there were some things that... I guess for me, I didn't like, I normally don't take note of or like particularly complain about in JRPGs that I did in this game where I'm just like, bro, there's like three songs in this game, like <laughs> three songs. And I'm like, you know, and JRPGs are supposed to have banger after banger after banger. And I like the battle theme, right? But I'm just like, it, there was just, you know, hardly any music. And this is an Atlas joint, man. Like, you expect that shit. Um, yeah, Keichi Okabe on the track. Yeah, so I'm just like, so that was weird. And, um, you know, and even with, like, the, like the, the Sabbath stuff, man, I was just like, you know, even though it might have been a little bit more in-depth than, like, Persona, like, uh, Persona's combat, it's, Persona's combat still had, like, it didn't matter because of how stylistic that persona was and soul hackers too. just like visually it was pleasing to look at, but like stylistically, you know, in combat, it wasn't, it wasn't there. It, it wasn't where yeah. it needed to be. Like and so when it came to the, the Sabbath stuff and also like, I feel like, you know, 10 hours in, I got the most that I would get out of those, out of the Sabbaths, even with like the, the upgrade like the stack skills that you were getting where it's like oh this will make you have two stacks instead of one now like i think the highest stack i got in the entire game was 11 and then like but like a third of the way through the game like you know 10 hours through the game 
I hit like nine or 10. So I'm just like, you know, I just didn't feel that progression that the combat system needed to have, um, you know, that I do get from other Atlas games. Like, and, and, and so that was a, that was like another big thing for me um, uh, there. Um, but, you know, again, like I still, I still enjoyed it. Like I would play a Soul Hackers 3 um, and that's just because I love Atlas, you know, and I, I'm willing to, uh, and I love JRPGs, so I'm willing to try try out things, um, especially for JRPGs. Um, and there were some cool things. There were also some cool, like, little, like, winks in the game as well. Like, um, like uh, the person that does the demon fusion is the same guy from the first game. He, like, complete, complete revamp. Instead of being in this, like, dark room in a mansion... He's like this, you know, circus lead guy, <laughs> but it's the same guy. It's the same guy, which is cool. Yeah, he's um, a vampire. Yeah, yeah, he's a vampire. That, he's a vampire. Yeah, he's a vampire. <laughs> um, and then I don't know. I feel like the the chick who does your uh your weapon upgrades. I'm pretty sure she talks about her her dad, who was like one of the vendors in the first game or something like <laughs> that. I, I don't. I don't. She she definitely she, was hinting at something that like was in regards to the first game because I was just like no like it was something that like there was no it had to have been it had to have been a wink to the first game because they were very much gesturing to like oh he was this guy that did this like it was like for those that knew who they were, it was kind of like a wink for those that knew but I I I I I couldn't I don't remember who it was but I I feel like it was a connection to the first game as well. But also, yeah, I mean, I she's don't... a Kuzanoa, um, and that's kind of like one of the big things about like, is this game a sequel or not? What are you trying to tell me? It's like you've got the Yatagarasi, you've got the Phantom Society, you've got the freaking Kuzanoa clan, and it's just like, again, it's like, why make the deep cut if you're not willing to like put the juice behind it and like, also, yeah, present yeah, and, it in a way that and makes also, sense. what was that bullshit with? a fucking dlc story oh yeah that is a new a completely new character and like when we because we all reviewed it we didn't get codes for that and we didn't even know about it until after we were done like at that like i was done with the game i was done with the game when that shit was announced i was like wait what i was like are y'all gonna send codes for that like you know (laughs) it's like oh you can only get it in the digital edition i'm like what that's like you're what like I, I, <laughs> that was wild to me that was absolutely did, like did anybody play that uh yeah and it was I'm just sorry. kind of like a ten dollar dlc of like here's a new dungeon and a person hmm. it, it was pretty what? like small was the dungeon well, like, like a, br- a a breakaway from what the rest of the game was dungeon wise or not really kind of it, it was like a new location but it was there really wasn't like a lot going Did, was on it connected it. at all to the to the story of, of slackers 2 it, it was pretty uh standalone self-contained why um, that doesn't make sense to me <laughs> i don't know it's a side story you know like, but what uh, why why was it necessary it wasn't that's my point i'm just like it would have been cool. Like I don't know. It would have been cool if it was like a tease to like, oh, this is gonna be the main character in the third game or something like that. But also, again, why make it digital only? Like that is so bizarre. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. I feel like Cam sort of got us to a to a natural, like, turning point. Unless anyone else has anything else to say about Soul Hackers Two specifically. Um, the fucking jack frost rainbow of weird food textures i just was not okay with any of them. oh i liked it you had blueberry frost you had strawberry oh, frost, frost melon dude. frost well, lemon yeah, frost. until i looked at the textures and i was just like this is grossing me out I don't <laughs> that was they're like dumb. jello this guy's yeah, gonna was... start growing mold in a week uh, I'm not gonna... yeah that was like uh, one of the uh, things that my goals like i was just like oh how many frosts are there and then there's like one of the bosses that you fight like near the far end of the soul matrix and it's all five of them out or six of them at once and i was like oh shit there's six because i think i only got like three or four at that point it's like oh shit there's six of them um yeah so no that was like 
one of my favorite parts of i was like if the, if y'all release like a figure line or like like a small figure uh, line or like a, a small plushy line of like all of them i would i would definitely buy <laughs> Uh, Make sure they're all plastic and not, you know, no, uh, no weird touch. Jello. <laughs> <laughs> they come in a Jello mold. That milk one, I'm just like, what? <laughs> I can smell that from here. <laughs> That's not great. I don't know. I didn't notice like the Demon Compendium was really small. Mm. Um, and that, that was another thing. It's like, why? I, I, again, I, I think, I think. We've all kind of touched on, I think, what some of the underlying problems are. I think Cam is not too wrong when this game probably didn't have a large budget. I think we've all kind of made different uh, sort of arguments for why we think they maybe tried to like slim the game down or make it more digestible, but they cut out maybe the wrong things or push together maybe the wrong things. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, I, I don't think any of us think this game is bad. I think it's just it doesn't have some of the core elements or like the one thing, even if the rest of the stuff is whatever, here's this one thing we can all latch onto and be like, yeah, this shit is fucking that good shit. I feel like that moment or that specific thing isn't necessarily there. Um, but Cam kind of hinted at like, you know, Oh, we, if we got a soul hackers three, I'd play that. Like I'd get that. I'd support it. I like Atlas, you know, I'd give it a shot, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. In a post Persona Five world, where like we had said, Persona Five, Persona Five Royal, kind of put Atlas, specifically Atlas JRPGs, in a different view of different yeah. consumers, different gamers, different people. You know, getting more more media access on websites that maybe wouldn't typically cover every JRPG or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, with Soul Hackers Two being what it was for all of us. Do we think there is a world where there is a Soul Hackers 3 or another non-Persona, non-SMT, Atlas JRPG that gets a bigger push or a bigger budget or, you know, platform exclusive, whatever it may be? I hope so. I don't know if there's a future for a Soul Hackers 3. Um, Yeah, that's... I mean, I, I don't know the sales numbers. I'm sure they're out there in some form, but I don't know. Like, even pre-release, it was hard. I And talking to other freelancers, it was hard for them to convince sites to cover the game because mm-hmm. I don't think Atlas had been pushing it enough as well. So it kind of, you know, that that's obviously that's not definitive about, like, how the developer and publisher feels about their game. But, um it felt like there was there wasn't enough uh, motivation oh, behind uh, it. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't enough buzz around it. So I don't know if like a because you know, like Lucas was saying, like this kind of came out of nowhere and uh, like what? Well, what? 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 Why are you bringing this one in particular? So for me, and I thought this could have been like them testing the waters for that. I hope this doesn't sour any perceptions about or for them to bring back any other piece of smt because i was actually just talking to a couple folks about this like i'm replaying uh raito kuzunoha versus uh soul's army and i think that game is fucking cool like even in today's like there's something there about it. it's an action rpg version and i was like yo what if Ah, what if like Omega Force, like they teamed up with Omega Force and uh, did like did like an action, uh, like because because <laughs> that that's a, that's Devil Summoners or Raido oh, Kuzunaha's man. thing is like oh it's it's SMT but action based in like early 1900s Japan and you're a detective. Like on paper, that sounds cool as fuck, and it is cool as fuck. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was ever like in the plans or ever in the books <laughs> for At- Atlas, but. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't think. I hope that Soul Hackers, like the 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 result of Soul Hackers Two, doesn't convince them from doing something like that mm-hmm. in the future. And like, may, maybe it's maybe they just go down the road with more Persona. Maybe they make like a Persona Four Strikers or whatever the fuck it might be. <laughs> um, I don't want Alice to stop experimenting with the other branches that they have because they're those things are beloved for a reason. Like, I don't think we're gonna get a Digital Devil Saga Three, but. If they wanted to touch on something in the Digital Devil Saga like branch of SMT, that would be cool as shit. Um, but what, what I think, if that were to happen, I think they would have to take a hard look at what Soul Hackers did wrong, like did good and didn't do so well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
why it didn't hit with I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone, but like we are their core audience. We are part of that um like target audience for them and we kind of came away with, you know, uh, I mean, y'all it seems like y'all liked it a little bit more than I did, but we're kind of similar feelings about it as a whole. Mm-hmm. And I hope that they would look at, okay, what did they like what did we hit? What did we not hit right? And kind of take that feedback into whatever next project they might they might have whether it might be like project re-fantasy or whatever i'm sure that's like a much more uh grander thing that's gonna have be much bigger budget um or if it's a like well persona 6 will be what it be what it is but if they want to do something like in the other smt branches um you know figure out what it is because like the, the thing for me with soul hackers 2 feels like they tried to be everything to everybody and in doing so mm-hmm. they came out with Nothing. Try to be a jack of all uh, trades kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and uh, they came out. They had a lot of jacks, <laughs> um, not not much trades. Um, yeah, and yeah, I just hope that they take that feedback to heart. And uh, and if they were to do it, yeah, uh, kind of think about you know, uh, like how they do dialogue, how they how they write their games. Because I I've said this a lot that Soul Hackers Two, you know, and talking about it, there there's there's a lot of good ideas there that just didn't um, like the path to get there didn't necessarily connect with me i think um i think like lucas you mentioning some of the the orphanage stuff it's like oh yeah yeah like you are right there there there's some subtext there i just don't think the game was written in a way to convince me that that was a thing like you like you have to take an extra step to read into it and like i don't mind doing that but i think the the game should be written in a way that kind of convinces you that that is like I don't want to be thinking about like, is this what the game intends? Is it not? I don't know. Like, um, so, but I do see value in those things. So I hope that they look at that and be like, Hey, we, you know, maybe we did some, we had something right with that aspect. Mm-hmm. Maybe we just do a better job of leading players and creating a story that does hone in on the stronger aspects. Um, I don't think it would be a soul hackers three, but, uh, I hope it's something. Cause I mm-hmm. think like Atlas has a lot of potential with, all the other stuff that they have. I think, um, yeah, I, th- I think regardless of the both critical and commercial like success or, you know, the stuff behind soul hackers Two after the fact, I hope they don't take too much of that to heart in their future business decisions. Like you were saying, I think what is probably going to really be kind of the, the, the marking for them on the, on the wall where they're going to see what is next um, I mean, obviously, Persona Six is is a thing that's going to happen, but I think more importantly, it's going to be they're probably more critically looking at the the success that Persona Five Royal is having right now when it comes out on Xbox and Switch because I think that's Atlas's like true path forward is they have an audience, they have this game that can pull more people in, but let's bring it to everybody like. A lot of their franchises or a lot of their games or or series are sort of known for being on a platform. Like there are certain games that are just locked on the 3DS. There are certain games that are locked on, you know, old PlayStation consoles or whatever it may be. I feel like they can look at the success of Persona and see how that translates outside of the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 and then maybe be like, all right maybe we can find some success in pockets and stuff like that. And I'm sure there'll still be like, you know, SMT uh, 5, maybe it wouldn't have got, maybe SMT 5 would have been sort of fallen into that same pocket of Soul Hackers 2 as far as like coverage and awareness if it wasn't a Switch exclusive game. Because Nintendo was invested in making sure that the game was known, you know, known about, you know, it was indirects, it was all, all over the place because they had an investment in it. And obviously PlayStation had an investment in Persona 4, uh, Persona 5 rather, being, you know, being a game people got their hands on. But I'm hoping with Atlas now finally seeing and Sega finally seeing, like, there is value in us putting these games out for everyone to play. Um, you know, maybe we do see some of these other SMT, you know, spinoffs getting more love. Maybe we do see, like, I don't know. I mean, I'm probably in the minority here. And, like, Atlas, you don't need to do this. But, like, if you did re-release, you know, Dancing in the Stars, Dancing Under Moon, like, I, I'd buy it again. Like, I would buy it on Xbox <laughs> or Switch. Like, I have it on PlayStation. I'll gladly buy it again. Um, yeah. g- give me give me a Persona 5 arena. Like, I'd eat that shit up. I would gobble that shit up. Um, Please. 
or like, or give us like a just give us like an SMT arena that's got Shin Megami characters, Persona characters, you know, whatever Devil Summoner, Soul Hacker characters. Like get them all in there. Give it, give us that, give us that Smash Smash Brothers, but Atlas. Yeah. Give me that. Throw throw some characters from Catherine. I'm all about it. Um, that's where Mega Force comes in. <laughs> Please. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think we can kind of all be hopeful that even if we don't see a Soul Hackers three, that we at least see more than a Persona six and more than uh, you know, yeah. Here's what does well. You know, I'm sure there will be a SMT six at some point, but mm. you know, I think there there is room for some of these other you know more niche titles to get a uh, you know X number chance at you know finding success elsewhere. Um, is there anything specifically that anyone would want to see Atlas bring out of the woodwork besides Trauma Center? Because Rock that's just do, come on. Baby. Oh yeah, how can okay. that's never it's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. Like you know, they they released on the Wii U, and again, I vividly remember my the the employee at the GameStop asking what that game was the day I picked it up. Um, <laughs> Incredible. They, they, they were like, they, I was like, oh, I'm here to pick up my copy of Tokyo Mirage Sessions, uh, you know, on Wii U, and she, he, he's just like, sharp and cold. What? Yeah, it's when you said sharp fe, that's when they were like, I don't know what this guy's fucking talking about right now. <laughs> yeah, so oh um, like, yeah, get the fuck out of here with your bullshit. You're just, <laughs> you're just saying yeah, words. So, <laughs> so there's that, and then um, um, but but yeah, and then they ported it to Switch, which I was even surprised. I like it was a dream for the longest time, but then it happened, and I was like, you know, lost my mind. And it's still probably my favorite game on the Switch. So um, well, I mean, maybe not now that Persona Five Royals they're like equal anyway. Um, uh, you know that I I would just love if they like if Nintendo gave them another chance, and they like again, kind of similar to Soul Hackers, which. Here's the thing also that I wanted to mention. Soul Hackers 2 actually makes me made me appreciate Tokyo Mirage Sessions even more because Tokyo Mirage Sessions was another game where you could tell that the, it didn't have a lot of budget. But but it used like it used like its resources to its best advantage I think like where you know you're you're traveling around Tokyo and like you don't see all the in, like you know there's all these crowds of people and they're, but they're not like actually detailed NPCs. They're just like silhouettes of different colors that match the art style. Like it looks so good. Like, it was very stylistic. Yeah. 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 Things like that, that like, you know, they knew that their budget wasn't there, but they, they used that as a way to express the game. And like, that's yeah. the thing The you know, that, that was the stuff that like made me appreciate Tokyo Mirage Sessions even more when I was playing through Soul Hackers too. And I, so I think that if they, you know, if now that the switch is so successful if they really did give tokyo mirage sessions another try I, i'll say like i think tokyo mirage sessions has the best dungeons of ever any atlas jrpg i've played like more than persona 5 royal more than persona 4 golden and and three like i i love the design like i love the puzzles i think they're really intuitive but um you know they just they just didn't have the backing that they needed at the time but now i think they do and i think that if they um if they were to give it another shot, I think that it would be much more successful. Listen, uh, Fire Emblem is like quickly becoming a core pillar to Nintendo. Yep. Persona's yep. hot. Yep. Put those two together. Yep. It works. That prints money right there. Um, it's weird what's like cool now compared to like, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago. It's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I think. A lot of that is how Soul Hackers 2 ended up the way it did. These games have always been on the like lower budget end, even back, you know, as far as like, yeah. the Saturn or the Super Family Con. Um, so like Persona taking off the way it has, especially with like over in Japan, like fewer and fewer people are playing console games um switch kind of reverse that a little bit but it's still eh. um so shimigami tensei was on handhelds for a while there because they just couldn't they couldn't make the numbers work um and so all of a sudden like persona blows up and now it's like oh shit people think it's a blockbuster now 
like what do we do next if we put out a 2d game on the switch like what well, you know people might get mad but we don't have the the cash but we want to try an hd console game anyway um yeah just i see with, that you know way on a shoestring um so i don't know maybe maybe like the next spinoff just has like a different kind of scale scope to it um and like to answer your question Brenda, i'd love to see like a a uh, collection of the super famicom games um just like the way square enix has been putting its little compilations out oh, just like yeah. do that um, i'd, I'd eat that require, up. yeah yeah mm-hmm. they'd have mm-hmm. to like localize most of that shit for the first time um which probably means it's not going to happen ever but like all that stuff is still connected and relevant to like the stuff they're doing now like the kuzanoas go back to the super famicom stuff it's it's all together it's just it, it would be nice to have something i mean fuck's sake we're getting suikoden in hd you know like you make, <laughs> yeah you can make anything happen on the switch mm-hmm. as long as you're not shooting yourself in the foot so. put it on switch put it on steam Xbox and PlayStation come after, you know what I mean? Like get get the get the cash flow from Switch and Steam, and then and then expand. That's that's it right there. So, I think we have exhausted these topics. I think we're getting to that point. Before we go, there is something that we always end the podcast on. It's a little game that we like to call "What's in the Box." If you're new to the show or you're just listening for the first time, or if, if the panel here isn't aware, I know Cam is, What's in the Game is a game where I take three games off the shelf behind me. I read the back of the box. I omit, you know, proper nouns, etc. The first person to guess the game correctly will get the point. Without further ado, game number one. Donkey Kong Country 2. <laughs> Sorry. Incorrect. You can guess, you know, <laughs> obviously within reason, you can continue to guess. There's no, you know, no, no buzzer, no, no time limit. Um, the epic, be- I'm sorry. You, mm, you don't need the full title of this game. The epic beginning of a new adventure. Embark upon an epic quest as the blank. Follow the hero and his loyal companions on their journey to unravel the mystery of an ominous threat that plots to plunge blank into chaos. A world... Oh, I see, I see, I see Michael... Is this Breath of the Gears? Wild? It is not Breath of the Wild. Okay. Keep going. A world of adventure awaits. Is I'm it pre- Xenoblade? It is not Xenoblade. I'm pretty sure the back of the box for Breath of the Wild has like maybe three words on it. Explore a beautiful living world. Assemble a colorful band of adventurers. Dragon Quest Eleven. It is indeed Dragon Quest Eleven. Oh, that's, I was, I was gonna say like Dragon Quest like eight or some shit. <laughs> Cam gets the point. You did an amazing job of just turning that into nothing <laughs> like, oh jesus christ this is every game that ever exists. you you'd be surprised sometimes when you just remove proper nouns how a lot of these boxes sound very similar yeah <laughs> game number two celebrate the blank anniversary of blank 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 with the definitive edition Adventure awaits for two friends. So you know Play Chronicles Definitive Edition? <laughs> no. <Okay>. Adventure <laughs> Adventure awaits for two friends brought together by fate to save the world from an ancient evil unleashed. Two friends. Fuck. Ah. Damn. Is this is this Fire Emblem Echoes Shadow of Valentia? Incorrect. Damn it. I do this own that game. Deep. <laughs> More uh, two friends. More blank arts. New characters. Arts. More story. Uh, Vesperia on Switch. Or whatever. It is indeed Tales yeah, of Vesperia. Yeah, 
Uh, uh, said arts. Oh, you fucked up. I, I had to give something. I get a little, little taste, little taste. <laughs> I'll just say trails. Oh, well, I can say <laughs> tales of Symphonia coming to, to main consoles. Mm, Thank God. Can't wait for yeah. that. That was that was the announcement I popped off on like throughout that entire Nintendo Direct last time. Yeah. I was like, oh fuck <laughs> yeah, let's go. The final game. Blank awaits. <laughs> <laughs> Blank always Blank awaits. <laughs> 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 Restore light to a kingdom conquered by darkness and discover your true blank. Stranger of Paradise. It is Stranger of Paradise. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you know we get that shit. Got one. <laughs> Let's go. We each got one. The, Let's go. The, the, first, the first word was chaos awaits. That's why I omitted it. Oh, I was like, yeah. if I say chaos, it's not gonna it's not gonna go well. Oh, where's mine? I got, I, ah, damn, I got my sweater too. I keep oh, that shit on deck. <laughs> it's an even, it's an even point spread for the evening with Go. everyone taken in one point. Uh, of course, I would get straight. <laughs> I fucking love that, that game. Funny. That was funny. So that'll do it for tonight's episode our special episode on soul hackers and atlas jrpgs but before we go please everybody take a moment first of all thank you all for spending the time hanging out you know talking about nonsense with me for a little while but everyone please plug all your shit stuff you got going on if you got stuff going on or want people to read or watch or listen or or whatever it may be um michael take the floor sure uh you could find me and all of my bullshit at michael p heim on twitter and I'm currently at fanboy.com, uh, covering Final Fantasy 14. New patches drop, so covering that uh, here and there. But, uh, you know, if folks have been paying attention, things have changed drastically at, at uh, video game website, fanboy.com. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I got some I got some, some things happening uh, that I can't quite talk about yet. But, uh, yeah, exciting. I'm, I'm excited for games uh, mm-hmm. in the near future. Mm-hmm. And I'm also excited for some of the things uh, that I may be doing in the near future. So, uh, yeah, find me on Twitter. That's mostly where I'm, like, doing my shit. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Cam, what about you? I have Lucas go next. Damn. All right. Damn. <laughs> Cam's, like, I'm, y'all. Cam's like, I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> Don't eat some mac and cheese. <laughs> Lucas, the floor is yours. All right. You can find me on primagames.com. Um for my part, I'm on the multiverses beat for some reason. Um, <laughs> and I recently reviewed Gotham Knights, um, which is a really weirdly similar situation where I got a seven and a half among fours and fives and sixes. So maybe, maybe that's my thing is just uh, finding finding the cool, weird parts of games nobody else really enjoys. Um, or, you know. Maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Hokutono Lucas, like this is the North Star. Um, I, I like to shit post, but I also disappear for days at a time, so you never know what you're going to get. Hell yeah. Cam, close us out. Play Tokyo Mirage Session, you <laughs> fuck. <laughs> oh, this fool. This Damn, fool. all right. Okay, hold on. Um, no, and, uh, Get on my level, Cam, with the Wii U you, Collector's you, Edition, oh, right? You, you do, ha- you, you do <laughs> have that on me. You, you do have that on me. Don't think that I'm not going to try eventually buy that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it. Oh um, literally, the only two pieces of Tokyo Mirage Sessions merchandise that exists are the games. So, um, But, yeah. Uh, Damn, it, imagine um, if we got Tokyo Mirage Session Amiibo. <sighs> that'd be so good. I just want I just want like a shirt. Like, Give me an official shirt or something. I want to rep it. Anyway. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Cam Final Mix. Um, I stream sometimes on twitch.tv slash Cam Final Mix if that tickles your fancy. Um, and I also have started TikToking a little bit on TikTok at Cam Final Mix. Um, so yeah, those are my things. And uh, do I have anything coming up? I mean, I have a bunch of previews on IGN like um, Signalis, you know, got... your jam, right? You I mean, preview I got for that a long or no? time ago. Yeah, I do. Oh, is that from PAX? But... Yeah, that's from PAX, but I did do that. Uh, I mean, like, that game is coming out soon, and um, I think it's going to be real good. Um, 
and uh you know i have other previews for like me into the hollower which is like yacht club games uh next uh game uh which is very good i did one for bandit 3 which is coming out next week so if you want to look into that um yeah ign.com hell yeah well like i said from the beginning before we started and just a few moments ago i really do appreciate all of you taking the time hang out with me talk about you know silliness mm-hmm. nonsense get get invested into some jrpgs um these are all great people if you listen to this and you don't follow them or interact with them or ingest their content the stuff they're making and doing like you're fucking up that that's that's on you not on me um so make sure you follow all them check out their stuff definitely uh you know they're all doing great things out there so again if you spend the time with me you're fucking up if you're not spending the time with them um you can find everything we do at pastcontroller.io you can find me of course at bgroom be good until next time